I didn't think Final Fantasy VII Remake was gonna make it. It's one of those games that was talked about well over a decade, joining the ranks of development hell with the likes of Half-Life 3, Tekken Cross Street Fighter, and Rockstar's Agent. These things, they take time. Ever since that initial tech demo in 2005, the concept of a remake of Final Fantasy VII has been tossed around, heavily rumored, overly theorized, and frankly, I'd given up. The task of doing a full AAA modern remake of a massive three-disc PlayStation 1 JRPG isn't a small one, and one that hasn't been properly attempted before. The closest example we have to something like this is the Dragon Quest VII remake on the 3DS, and I don't know about you guys, but there's a bit of a clear striking difference between the two. Uh, money? But despite all the troubled development, despite the literal decade of hype with several delays and entire development studios having their work scrapped, Final Fantasy VII Remake is out. It's real. This is a thing that you can tangibly touch, and that's weird. So I guess we're going to talk about it. So yo, it's Austin, and today we're going to be taking a long-awaited look at the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Thank you very much to Square Enix for providing me with a review copy. I was finally noticed. So anyone familiar with the channel probably already knows that I'm all about that Final Fantasy Square Enix life, so if you want to see some of my previous Final Fantasy VII opinions, you can do so in the starter video I made. But for now, we're going to talk about what really matters. Cloud Spores! Graphics sure have come a long way. It's funny to look at the original Final Fantasy VII and think that at one point, this was the bleeding edge. It's cliche to talk about VII's visuals like they're an anomaly these days, but I've always found them to be extremely charming. Even on the PlayStation 1 on a tiny TV where the resolution was so low, it was like I was looking at an interactive kaleidoscope. Yup, this is fine. I used to think Eris was wearing a onesie for too long. But beyond a couple of large narrative issues I have with the last bits, the original Final Fantasy VII is one of those games that'll stick with you forever. The combat system was fast-paced, especially compared to its PS1 brethren. The materia system for skills and spells was perfect. The open world felt huge and the music some of the best in the series. The characters? They're okay. It's no Final Fantasy IX, VI, IV. 12, but it certainly left the largest cultural impact. It's the only Final Fantasy to get its own compilation with multiple world expanding prequels, sequels, movies, regardless of the quality. But let's not pretend you didn't have that Advent Children wall scroll of Cloud. I didn't. Mine was Yuffie. If I rank all of my Final Fantasies, Seven falls firmly into the middle. Maybe a bit lower with all the extended stuff, but the possibility of a remake was a chance to fix a lot of things. But in 2020, and even, you know, the last 10 years, a simple graphical upgrade wasn't gonna do. When Seven originally released, it was the most mainstream you could get. Beyond the initial shock that the newest Final Fantasy would be moving to the PlayStation after being Nintendo exclusive for a decade, it dominated magazine covers. It was the talk of the schoolyards. It even had primetime television commercials. Your mom knew about this. Where did four, five, and six go? This is it, according to this game fan preview. Ah yes, my favorite Final Fantasy character, Bullet. A remake of one of the most widely known and well-received JRPG adventures of all time was going to be heavily scrutinized by everyone, no matter what they made. This includes yours truly, but uh, that's, that's kind of what I do. I'm clearly the most definitive source for everything Final Fantasy related. Now that it's out and the 8.8 .8 Twilight Princess memories are flooding back like the beach shores in Chrono Cross, I think that there is surprisingly a lot to talk about with this game. All of the pre-release information with Seven was vague to say the least. For those not closely following development blogs and interviews, also known as most of you, it wasn't exactly clear that Remake wasn't going to be a full remake of Final Fantasy Seven. Instead, they suggested that the game was going to be episodic. Turns out this baby's ending at the party's escape from the Shinra-owned Utopia Midgar. So four and a half hours into the first disc, approximately 10% of Final Fantasy VII. I was initially thrown off by this considering all of my personal favorite parts of VII are not in that. Yuffie, Sid, the Gold Saucer, there's no goddamn tea today, friends. Square Enix said that they were going to be expanding those nearly five hours into a full Final Fantasy, showcasing new areas of Midgar and giving us more time to engage with the original members of Avalanche. Lord knows we needed that, considering in Final Fantasy VII, Jesse said like 12 and a half things. And finally, maybe the guy who are sick can be a character. But not before scrapping the entire project and starting again. Square Enix thought it 
was a good idea to have CyberConnect 2, the dudes who brought us the NART games, Asura's Wrath, and .hack to be in charge of this, and, well, that did not go as planned. It makes sense, too, considering the initial 2015 trailer wasn't the best. Frame rate issues in my reveal trailer? It's more likely than you think. In 2017, Square Enix then decided to take it all in-house, and three years later, Remake finally existed for real. So keep in mind that the Final Fantasy VII Remake we're playing is one that only had three-ish years in the oven, not 15, like I'm sure a few of you think. Don't be silly. I can finally say I am holding Final Fantasy VII Remake in my hands. Is this real? We open with a remade intro cutscene. Rather than nervously gazing through the stars waiting for that memorable note to begin playing, we're instead drafted over a mountainous desert guided by an eagle to the upper plates of Midgar where we see a metropolis skyline not unlike one on Earth. It's like the opening to Oliver and Company. Look how peaceful and normal things are. Billy Joel having a good time singing. That's before we're taking to the actual Final Fantasy VII opening deep down in the slums, taken through a beautiful CG remake of the original sequence. I like how there's this noticeable transition from pre-rendered cutscene to gameplay with the train smoke, but also it's barely noticeable. It's not like going from Big Eris, uh, or Aerith into Triangle Cloud Man here. Square Enix must have made a pact with the graphic gods because this game is gorgeous. At least when it's dark, but we'll get there. Everyone looks great. The last time video game hair looked this good was Final Fantasy 15, probably. This opening sequence was all in the demo, but man, does it play well? If you had asked me years ago if Final Fantasy should fully ditch the turn-based battle system, I would have said no, absolutely not. The active time battle system has been a staple of the series for a while, and its simplification is one of the the weaker parts of 15. However, 7 Remake learned from the last 10 plus years of battle systems and created something that's a hybrid of character action and RPG. It's a perfect fit for the more action-packed narrative Remake decides to use. At times, it feels closer to Bayonetta or Devil May Cry than Final Fantasy, and that comes with some positives and negatives. Each playable character controls in a completely different manner, some more fun than others. Tifa, of course, being the best, but this game has been crafted around letting each character shine in every fight they're involved in. Since the Midgar section of 7 wasn't open world like the rest of the game, this makes perfect sense. So this intro with Cloud and Barrett shows you how each character excels against different enemy types, introduces you to the stagger and ATB systems, and it's dramatic, it's fine, it's what it needed to be. Maybe a bit dragged out, but that's pretty much everything in this game. Things seem simple enough, but it turns out Square Enix decided to put a much larger emphasis on bosses. Now, the boss fight has always been a weird thing in JRPGs. Final Fantasy VII had a thing where you would suddenly be tossed into a boss fight out of nowhere. No build up, and a lot of the time the fight and enemy design itself was very unmemorable. Cloud sets up a bomb and is like, it's coming. There's a giant red scorpion. Okay, this worked 20 years ago, but in 2020, these things need to have a big reveal or entrance or some kind of buildup. Every boss fight in a remake is not only challenging, but is made out to be a huge deal. Red Scorpion bot appears and it's crawling up walls and shooting its big laser. Cloud and Barrett are yelling things at each other. They won't shut up, actually. It's like having two raid leaders, except one of them says all the wrong things. Attack when the tail's up. Cloud, you idiot! There's a lot to talk about, y'all. Fight cinematography, dynamic music pieces, fluid combat transitions, the actual movie quality cutscenes, and shot composition. They really went all out. While it does look awesome, 7 Remake's combat system actually has a pretty decent learning curve, but once you master it, it feels real good. Not like Dynasty Warriors good. Real good. I don't think Final Fantasy will ever reach big combo levels of complexity, but I do think that 7 Remake's combat system is one of the best they've ever made. Yeah, for real. Taking notes from Final Fantasy 13, 15, Kingdom Hearts, and in my opinion, a little bit of Star Ocean, 7 Remake kind of puts all of these together to make something truly unique. Each character has a completely different fighting style, which is a feat on itself, but they also utilize a little ATB meter that you can see on the bottom right. This fills up naturally over time, 
time, but gets a boost anytime you slap a dude around. New to the game are weapon abilities you can learn from each weapon you find that'll do all kinds of different things. Cloud has various flips and slices, or swinging his baseball bat, single target, and AoE. Tifa uses Chi to power herself up and inflict additional stagger damage. Barret is the ranged tank of the group and can not only do big shooting, but also absorb others' damage. Aerith plays similarly to a black mage in 14 and can create wards in the ground to increase the party's ATB regeneration speed or enable dual casting. Other than that, she kind of just flips around and throws marbles at people. Every playable character feels completely different with this alone, but I haven't even touched Materia. Th that's every character, right? Someone missing? Almost exactly like Seven, magic exists in this world in the form of Materia. These are little Mako-infused MacGuffins that give you abilities like fire, ice, healing, etc. Every weapon and accessory in the game has a slot for Materia, you know the drill, hopefully. These are desirable by not only little ninjas, but the player as well. You've got magic Materia for your spells. You've got command Materia. These give you new abilities like Assess and Chakra. Then we have the support Materia. You'll usually want to use these in conjunction with a magic Materia. There's purple materia, which are just passive bonuses. And lastly, we've got summoning materia, a staple in Final Fantasy and one that's still here. More on that later. Also, Carbuncle. Not, not about it. How did you do this and then that? The Materia system, while not as in-depth or customizable as 7 Original, translates one-to-one -one here and proves that it was an amazing combat mechanic in the first place. Stack weapon types and abilities on top of that, and you have yourself a deep combat system that's real fun, it's real good, I really enjoy every second I'm in combat. Except when the, the camera gets stuck and I'm in a corner just being fucked on. Fucked on? Which happens more than you'd like. I was surprised to see Barrett's melee offerings available here, but well, there they are. He's the slowest of the bunch like this, but when he hits, it hits real hard and increases the stagger gauge. This is taken pretty directly from Final Fantasy 13, and I gotta say, it works extremely well here. A lot of enemies have a natural defense you have to break through, and you have to figure out how to stagger them in order to take them down quicker. This isn't just bosses either, several normal enemy types basically require you to pay attention to take things down. You can't just mash square, unless you're on easy. <laughs> Game's too easy, apparently. Each character has a focused attack that's specific specifically does stagger damage. The only major difference is in 13, you have to keep it up while 7 keeps that stagger in place. You also have to work to get a lot of your spells to hit. They have casting times, they have target patterns. It's not like any other Final Fantasy where you'll just hit the button and they'll catch on fire. That fire has to travel across that X, Y, and Z axis. <laughs> Certain spells like Lightning and Bio are gonna hit due to their nature, but something like Blizzard is a lot tougher to land. You ever cast Blizzaga and then your target's like, nah? Oh, I'm praising this, but it's not perfect. Some of the basic melee combos have a bit of jank to them. You can't cancel out of attacks or animations, and Cloud has some big fancy animations, so it's relatively easy to find yourself getting stuck. That, in air combat, doesn't feel good. Anytime I'm in a situation where I'm playing as Cloud and need to attack someone above me, he does this useless three-hit combo in the air. But it's not that big of a deal since you can usually just use a spell or switch your characters, which just use Barret. Always use Barret. Oh, and we can't forget summoning materia. Throughout the story, you'll find these fancy red materia lying around, and these give you the ability to summon. These are not found in Midgar at all in the original game. There's not any, like, official reasoning or lore for them being there. They're just red jewels that have mighty beasts in them, given to you by Chadley. I hate Chadley. I hate his face. This time around, we've got legendary summons such as Fat Chocobo, Chocobo Chick, Chocobo and Moogle, Cactar. C Carbuncle. <laughs> Just kidding, we got Shiva and Ifrit too. So typically in a Final Fantasy, you'll summon your dude and it'll pop onto the screen via some extremely extra cutscene and then a big number will appear and that's it. Goodbye MP. However, Remake takes a different approach. Summoning them seems to be a mixture of situational and random. Each character has a summon materia slot and sometimes a meter will appear letting you know a summon's about to be ready, just like 15. But instead of pressing the button and snoozing, the summon then joins you on the battlefield. They'll attack whatever you're targeting and you can consume some of you or your party members ATB meters to have them do a special attack. One that'll usually blow up the stagger meter. Any character can use the summon ability once it's out, so sometimes it's beneficial to try and spam those before time runs out and they leave. Not without doing a big cinematic though, you gotta have that. It's not Final Fantasy if there's not a cutscene of a summon. Also you can use items, you'll probably be using a lot of items, especially if you're like me and think raised materia is a waste of a slot, until you play hard mode, then, then you need it. It feels like classic Final Fantasy. 
almost like a perfection of what 13 and 15 wanted to do. It has the impact and flair those games were missing, and maybe that's like 30% the screen shake and particle effects, but it sure as hell is satisfying to play. I, I like it. So, it's fun to play, but if the story and characters aren't very good, then what, what are you there for? Thankfully, Final Fantasy VII does have a source material, so you already know, well, maybe you already know that you're gonna like it or not, but we're all about spoilers here today, so buckle up. Let's get to talking. The well-known spoiler is a concept that has begun to escape film and transcend into other forms of media. Sure, everyone knows that Mario's princess is in another castle, that the mysterious Sheik is actually Zelda, or the implications of Would You Kindly in Bioshock. Some even become memes in the case of the letter F, or with Final Fantasy VII, it becomes a rather and wholesome website. When you remake something like this with a well-known spoiler, it sets a lot of expectations. Since you already know the outcome of specific situations, does the remade version of it feel impactful and soulful, or manufactured? Well, since this game only goes up to the escape from Midgar, I don't know the answer to that, but I can say with a few exceptions, I think Remake did its source material solid. The characters from Final Fantasy VII need little to no introduction, as the roles in the Final Fantasy VII story are pretty standard fare. They become much deeper, just not in Remake's story. Cloud Strife is the ex-military tough guy who has a hard time acting in a sociable manner and suffers from frequent delusions. Get help. <laughs> he begins the game with a totally put on tough guy act when he's super not that, he's kind of a goober. Rest assured, this is original Cloud, not not that one movie's Cloud, and 90% of his original character arc is not in this game. Nailed it, I know, thank you, moving on. Barrett Wallace is the leader of an eco-terrorist branch of Avalanche stationed in Sector 7 who wants to save the planet, man. He's also kind of a goober, but he can get serious when the situation demands it. He's also the father of Marlene, a little girl that hangs out at 7th Heaven. Or is he? Most of Barrett's original character arc isn't in this game. Also, I always thought it was pronounced Mako, but apparently it's... Uh, Mako! Mako! Mako uh. is the lifeblood of our world! Tifa Lockhart is Cloud's childhood friend. She's also a part of Avalanche. Despite her appearance, she's pretty reserved and timid when it comes to actual conflict. She's a martial artist that was trained by the legendary Zangen and is basically this game's monk. A punch girl by the most dictionary of definitions. Tifa's individual character arc is not in Final Fantasy VII, but I still like her. Aerith Gaines, shit. Aerith Gainsborough, I'm never gonna be able to adapt to that, is a young florist that Cloud stumbles upon multiple times throughout Final Fantasy Fantasy VII. Her character is a peculiar one, and in the source material, she was closer to a plot device than a full-on character. 23-year-old spoilers her, obviously, but she is an ancient, a descendant of the once prosperous civilizations on Earth. Uh, Gaia, my bad. But that's only mentioned in this game. Instead, Remake Earth is a flirty gamer girl that the player simps because she says things like shit. I'm not some princess who needs to be coddled. Shit. Also, she's pretty endearing, I guess. Red 13 is in this game. You can't play as him. I didn't watch all the trailers, so I didn't know that until I got him at my party and I was pretty sad about it. He's a severely underwritten character in the original Final Fantasy VII who has a really brief emotional arc, but you're not gonna see any of that in Remake. He's kind of just there. Pour one out for Ryuji, y'all. See, see you in the next one. For real? Yuffie, Sid, and Vincent, my three favorite Final Fantasy VII characters are not in this game. You can only imagine how I feel. Kate Sith's ass is, though. Speaking of, Reeve has more than two lines now, so that's pretty cool. Maybe he'll get his own character arc in Final Fantasy VII Remake 3. My point being, Final Fantasy VII Remake focuses on a very specific point of Final Fantasy VII, and it tried to do its best to expand on things that happened there. Did it succeed? That's up for debate, but it did give a bunch of screen time to everyone's favorite trio of jobbers, Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge. These three are the other members of Barrett's Avalanche, and were once known for deep, meaningful, and emotional lines such as Code Deciphered and Code Deciphered. But now they're kind of characters. Both Jesse and Wedge get a decent amount of screen time, Biggs not so much. Remake takes the three of them and elaborates more on how young and inexperienced they are at being the type of people to blow up a Mako reactor. Biggs has this cocky cool guy vibe about him, but doesn't mind having a bit of a moan. Wedge feels like he's useless all the time, collects cats, and has really bad self-esteem. It's up to you to make him feel better. Don't make Wedge feel bad, that's me. And lastly, there's Jesse. Jesse Raspberry, apparently. Of the three, she's definitely the one who got the most characterization and development. Probably of any character besides Cloud in this game, actually. While in the original, she was just 
there. Remake Jessie is shown to have a family living in the upper plate of Sector 7. She was originally an actress working at the Golden Saucer prior to her father having a workplace accident, now comatose from Mako poisoning. She then decides to join Avalanche in order to get revenge, deciding not to mention that to her parents at all. Whoops. She's got a very erratic personality. It's hard for the people around her, the player included, to tell what she's really thinking. The internet's basically embraced Jessie as extremely thirsty of Cloud, but considering the way Biggs and Wedge seem to react to that, it's likely an act. Jessie's the jokester of the group, the comic relief. She may not have the most screen time of the main cast, but she certainly sticks around in your mind. Props to Satomi Moriya, her Japanese seiyu, for making her sound like a goofy bro that says, Psych! <laughs> Then, of course, there's the entire villain squad of Final Fantasy VII, who, for a majority of the Midgar sequence, is just a faceless corporation that you see staring down from high towers. Unfortunately, not much has changed in that regard, with the exception of a few side characters. The evil slum lord Don Corneo has had his role fleshed out a decent amount in theory, although his on-screen time isn't much higher. When you walk into Walmart, you can see the effects of his mafia-like oppressive hand on the entire slum sector. You see the near complacency that people feel towards his treatment of women, and it makes you that more desperate to rescue Tifa. I just wish he had a little more screen time, especially because he's got that belly jiggle. That's the good shit. The only Shinra Corporation members to get a decent amount of screen time are the President himself, Reeve, Rufus, the nefarious monologue-prone Hojo, and militaristic Heidegger, who has substantially less beard than I would have liked. Directly under him, of course, is the Turks. Who doesn't love the Turks? <laughs> Late separation initiated. You son of a bitch! What have you done?! Avalanche, probably, but they've always been likable lackeys, and the remake does a good job of giving them more screen time. Rude and Reno were always two of my faves, and they get some good moments here. Like when Rude's glasses break and he puts on another pair. Perfection, bravo, video game characters are good. I guess there's that Sephiroth guy too. He's not supposed to be in this game, but they're changing stuff. I've always had mixed feelings on Sephiroth as a villain, but if Remake has done one thing incredibly right, it's give us his piercing cat-like stare. It's genuinely dis Disconcerting. I can't imagine how Cloud feels. Well, kinda, considering he has constant sharp migraines and head-clenching, nightmare-inducing delusions. It's not quite the wheelchair Cloud I was hoping for, but it's close. So those are all of the major players in Final Fantasy VII Remake, and they did their best to stick to the source material. However, they did add a bunch of minor and side characters that we will talk about now. There's the clearly Namora-designed Roche, who was heavily advertised with Seven Remake. He's a current member of Soldier, who is there to show us that Cloud's ex-boys mean business. Except he's kind of a joke. He rides the motorcycle, and then he goes away. I thought he was gonna come back, but nope. I really have nothing to say about this guy. He, he He's there. And the next guy was in the original with a way more minor role, having like a handful of lines, but just about every second with Johnny on screen is the best. If there's one thing Final Fantasy VII, one of the most depressing Final Fantasies actually needed, it was a character to call Cloud bro at every possible moment. That's not even sarcasm. I love Johnny. He's basically what would happen if you put Yosuke Hanamura into Midgar, and guess what? Same voice actor. It's canon. Thanks, Yuri. Damn, bro! That's why you're such an awesome dude! New to the story are a few side characters from the novel The Kids Are Alright, a Turk's side story. These I'm not too hot on. This book took place in between Final Fantasy VII and Advent Children, and expanded on what happened in Midgar after the whole, you know, planet-destroying nightmare cover of the freaking game was stopped. Personally, I thought they were needlessly thrown into the story. Leslie is this dude straight from Shibuya 104 who works for Don Corneo. He's the criminal with a heart of gold who becomes a not bad guy and instead helps the player. Except every second he was talking or doing something, I was ready for the scene to end considering I know what's coming up. Also, he's trying to kill Don Corneo in one scene and he literally walks up to him with a gun to surprise him, I guess? Leslie, you have a gun. Just Colt, do the thing. It's a ranged weapon. Your Final Fantasy class is literally machinist. Last and least, there's Kairi, who I'll admit I have an irrational distaste for. It's not necessarily her fault. She's just an opportunistic fake news spreading bandit type who is three steps away from being Alex Jones. I'm not trying to have multiple Persona 4 references in one video, but she also looks a bit like Marie. The problem is that there's a side quest where you find my boy, Johnny, freshly robbed of his wallet. He describes the thief as a tomboy with straight black hair and stockings, and then the name of the quest, Tomboy Bandit, pops up. 
Gee, turns out that five minute walk back to Aerith's church to accept my GPS quest was a five minute walk to break my heart. Feast your eyes on- Whoa! 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 It is I. Kyrie. For the most part, the story of Remake follows the original to a T. With the exception of the Sector 7 upper plates and the last few bits, you can expect some raw Final Fantasy 7 here. Some moments are more successful than others, and I think knowing the outcome of particular scenarios is a big factor in that. Knowing who is going to die and win definitely affected my enjoyment of certain scenes, but I think newcomers will be in for a ride, at least until a few of the controversial parts of the ending. We'll talk about the major changes at the end, but for now, look at Don Corneo's belly jerk. A game with belly jiggle, but no booby jiggle. Gamers, uh, they're mad. So the combat and the story alone are pretty good pieces of a puzzle, but how does that all fit together? Final Fantasy VII Remake is a modern AAA game, which means that it's probably going to adhere to a bunch of the 2020 AAA video game tropes. And after going all the way through the game, doing pretty much everything that I could, I gotta say, it's not perfect. Like I said, every single second I was in combat was grand, but any second I spent backtracking, solving puzzles, or roleplay walking through debris and ledges was a slog. Final Fantasy VII Remake is the premier example of why consoles need the SSD. The amount of time you spend bending over and crawling through tight spaces can easily add up to over two hours of the game. This masks a lot of the world loading around you and is used in games all the time, but Remake sure has a ton of this. This is minor, but certainly something that took me out. The entire game has this kind of padding in various forms. Chapters in Remake work in one of two manners. You've got linear action sequences and then more open and exploration heavy sections, some of these with a plethora of side quests you can do. The game basically shifts between being linear and borderline open world at different points, and I don't think it's too controversial to say that the open sections are noticeably weaker to play. None of it awful, but it feels like riding a roller coaster and then having to wait in line to do cool flips again. No fast pass today. Similarly to Final Fantasy XV, most of the side quests you do in Midgar are game padding. There's not much world building added beyond what the original game does. I like cats as much as Wedge and any other person, but the cat fetching quest is a pure time waster that didn't need to be here. Personally, I would have preferred 7 Remake be entirely linear or at least follow a level based structure. The only exceptions I can think of are Wall Market and wall market, but only because those quests don't require you to run out of town to kill five mole rats or whatever AAA trope is thrown in. Sometimes during travel segments, Remake will take the combat out of the player's hand in order to toss them an old school variety puzzle to mixed results. But you can tell that they cared about the source material. For example, in the path taking you from wall market to sector five, you have these mechanical hands you have to move to toss Aerith around. Now you could see these destroyed mechanical hands in the original game actually as parts of the background. The fact that they turned it into an actual gameplay mechanic is cool and all, but I certainly wish they didn't. This just slows the pace down to a crawl as you deal with janky controls, I think making them a big set piece in the back that you walk over would have had a more interesting visual impact instead of making me spend 20-30 minutes on a puzzle escort sequence. This particular example isn't a large percentage of the game, but Remake does have a lot of things like this happen throughout the 33-ish hour experience. Moving storage boxes and elevators in the upper plates, navigating through the sewers, navigating through these sewers, navigating through these sewers. It's a lot of sewers and air ducts in Midgar, huh? It's pure padding that doesn't have much dialogue beyond one-liners happen between whatever characters you have in your party. I think that took a couple years off my life. It feels very video gamey in a game that loves being a movie, what with its 10 hours of cutscenes. Very well made movie at that. Now, that's not to say all of the mini games are time wasters. I was happy to see how much was recreated from the original game. Cloud squatting, got it. Also, Tifa does pull ups. Game ends in Midgar and you need a battle arena that isn't the gold saucer, you got the Corneo Coliseum. You need to sneak out at night? No more games. <laughs> I wanted more of this kind of stuff. There were moments when Final Fantasy VII felt like it was following the Yakuza route of world exploration, but the amount of activities you can do is unfortunately very limited in comparison. No pocket razors here. In fact, comparing Yakuza and Final Fantasy VII Remake is a very, very good comparison. Basically what I'm saying is that VII Remake is at its best when it's Devil May Cry 5, with the occasional town to chill in, and darts. Look at this smug boy. Remake is more of a reimagining or soft reboot of Final Fantasy VII, and while it does do a couple things one-to-one, -one, it does actually do a couple of new things. Is that a good thing? 
yes and no? This here's your final spoiler warning, by the way. Turns out a 23-year-old game has brand new spoilers, who'd have thought? Aside from new NPCs, initial trailers made it pretty clear that Remake was gonna be trying something different. I think the swarms of spectral anime ghosts made that pretty obvious. Well, as it turns out, these are called whispers. Aerith getting too close to Cloud, push him away. Aerith about to fall into the church, pick her up. Someone somewhere they aren't supposed to be, whisper there, ready to go. Gee, I wonder what that is supposed to represent. As explained by my boy Red, the Whispers are the harbingers of fate. They exist purely to keep things on track. As in, Final Fantasy VII is supposed to go a specific way. As in, these are the purest fans keeping the developers on track. Except the time where they save Wedge when the plate falls, which totally didn't happen. Initially, I thought this was just gonna be a part of Cloud's delusions, but no. You got Barrett and the entire squad shooting at him. Then the entire city of Midgar is engulfed by him as you fight Heartless Darkseid. But how did we get here? So once you've finally reached Shinra HQ, a ton of story elements have some pretty major changes. Throughout the entire game, we've been seeing little flashes of Sephiroth here and there, something that painted him as the villain way before the original does. He's always slowly walking towards Cloud or touching his shoulder. He's just kind of there. Like Square wanted to blow the Sephiroth load way before it was properly time in the original narrative. Generally, Remake's modern production and storytelling is on point and perfectly captures the pre-existing story, but I think there's a handful of moments that are significantly weaker now. In the 1997 game, Sephiroth is only mentioned via text at this point as a cool guy or a mighty soldier who's no longer alive. Both games have Aerith get captured while the plate falls, which by the way, the scene of Aerith turning herself over in the remake and saving Marlene is mwah, muy bueno. The party then climbs the wall ruins between Sector 7 and Wall Market to reach the upper plates and infiltrate Shinra HQ. In both games, you can pick the elevator or climb the stairs, and why you would ever take the elevator is beyond me. Who doesn't want to see Cloud, Barrett, and Tifa slowly lose their minds? Cloud, slow down! Remake has a nice touch where Cloud gets slower and the music gets messed up as you climb higher. No Tifa freaking out about Barrett looking up her skirt though. Where's the whisper there? But it's when you reach Hojo's lab that things are vastly different. It's revealed in both versions that Shinra wants to use Aerith's innate ancientness in order to find the holy promised land of the Cetra, but they think that it won't be doable in her lifetime. So what better way to achieve this than to breed and dissect her? That's fine. Yuck. We're also introduced to the mysterious Red 13 at this point, who joins the party by happenstance, although differently in each version. In Remake, he's accidentally released when Aerith gets her freedom. In the original, he's brought up into the same platform as her, implying that Hojo was gonna try uh, crossbreeding her with a life form that has a longer lifespan. Ugh. I think that this version of the events is way more nefarious and showcased Hojo as more vile. In Remake, you end up falling into Hojo's spooky lab of spooky containers with a big ass Genova ready to be yoinked away. I much prefer the subtlety of seeing a random container in Hojo's lab that Cloud could barely stand to look at. Barrett's like, well this is kinda weird, but the scene of Cloud peering in and freaking out at the headless Genova felt more powerful than Cloud being frozen in place by Sephiroth again. The party escapes Hojo's mall haunted mansion of human experimentation to see a trail of bluish goo leading all the way up to President Shinra's office, where you find him dangling from the side of a reactor begging for help. Barrett gets a nice moment here where he pulls him up and has the power to do anything he wants, but instead tries to negotiate. But this sequence of events loses a lot of impact from the original. Instead of spending an hour plus in Hojo's gallery of Saiyan pods and totally legal practices, the party retrieves Aerith parties up with Red 13 and heads straight for the elevator. Except, you don't get to escape. Rude follows you in and is like, would you press up please? And Cloud's like, oh shit. It builds the Turks up as more of a threat. At this point, we've only fought against Reno and that fight ended with Sector 7 being completely destroyed. In Remake, we've already bested both Reno and Rude in combat twice. And while they're dope fights, it downplays their importance in the story. Cloud, Barrett, Red 13, Tifa, and Aerith all surrender to just two Turks, and that is awesome. You're brought before President Shinra, who does the villain thing before sentencing the party to execution and putting them in prison. It's completely unknown what's gonna happen next. The party's talking to each other, Aerith tries to flirt with Cloud, and Tifa's like, yo, I'm here. After falling asleep, completely at a loss of what to do, Cloud wakes up to see that his door is wide open and the guard is dead. A track called Trail of Blood plays through this sequence, even during 
random battles, depicting heaps of destruction and death through multiple floors of this giant corporate building. Eventually, you make your way up to the executive floor to find President Shinra's body impaled into his desk by none other than Sephiroth's blade. The first confirmation that Sephiroth is alive. To me, this is the moment when Final Fantasy VII becomes Final Fantasy VII. Everything prior to this feels like an introduction to the base characters. It's a sudden realization that everything you've been fighting for is small, that there's a much larger threat on the horizon, and this is only exemplified by the party's escape from Midgar to be greeted with an actual open world, something other Final Fantasies prior usually had from the get-go. When they finally get some rest in the town appropriately named Calm, Cloud leads us through a flashback that he totally lived himself about his life as a soldier, the Nebelhem fires, and Sephiroth's descent into madness. If that wasn't enough, we reach a massive body of water that isn't easily passable due to this giant Midgar Zolum snake that inhabits it. That thing is designed to destroy your party at this point, but when you're finally able to cross it via Chocobo, you come across one of those creatures beautifully rendered, impaled on a tree, cementing not only Sephiroth's sheer power, but his unyielding cruelty. So that was the PlayStation 1 version, but now let's talk about the remake. There's quite a lot of differences here, and the last four hours give off a lot of implications for things to happen down the line. Rather than being found dead for who knows how long, President Shinra whips out his villain-esque golden gun and a monologue before Sephiroth yeets his sword directly through him and Barrett for some reason. Then we're tossed into a boss fight against Genova, who in the original, we don't touch into the boat sequence, but here we are. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, you're used to the Genova boss fight being sudden and out of nowhere, so it's not that unusual, and the fight was extremely fun. Plus those remixes. Those remixes though, in fact, all of the music and gameplay from here to the end is some of the best video gaming I think I've ever had. I just find myself pretty underwhelmed by all of the narrative changes they made. If you're gonna kill Barrett, it. Do it. Instead, the inconsistent whispers either took the blow for or healed Barrett back to life. Having the full knowledge of what the whispers do, maybe, the potential emotional impact was reduced to zero. Then we toss the whispers out the window for an amazing showdown against Rufus, who makes his impact way harder than in the original, before the party makes their escape. All is good, I thought as the recording has stopped notification showed up on my PlayStation 4, immediately letting me know that things are about to get weird. Is this illegal footage now? Hey, remember Roche, the motorcycle riding soldier? Wouldn't this part be great for him? <laughs> I really would. The cinematography and fight against Motorball was some of the best the game has to offer. It's real fun, but Motorball isn't really the final boss of a video game. Knowing Remake was coming to a close soon meant that things had to ramp up in a big JRPG manner. Coming into this, my thoughts were that this would be a perfect spot to have Rufus come back on a helicopter, preferably the one from the original game, not this hind, with Sang, Rude, Reno, Elena, and give us a big, ridiculous 5 on 5 boss fight highlighting each character's individual abilities before we turn away from Midgar for who knows how long. Sang never has a proper fight in Final Fantasy VII, so this was a perfect opportunity to show us what he could do. But it turns out the final boss would be a big anime fight against Destiny and Final Fantasy VII on the PlayStation 1. Things go full meta here. Aerith and the party are aware of the events of Final Fantasy VII and its ending. Sephiroth has, in my opinion, misled them with visions and is trying to get them to change destiny so he can win. Sephiroth is taken on the role of alien Satan, Aerith the role of old Jesus. The whispers get enraged by the party trying to change the tides of destiny, a massive heartless appears, you fight it over the crumbling buildings, f flying highways, before a battle against the Silver Fox himself. Once you win, after a sequence that is a direct reference to the final showdown between Cloud and Sephiroth in the crater, destiny has been altered. The party leaves Midgar to begin the quote unknown journey, and the ending shows us a few changes. Most notably that Biggs is alive. Why Biggs? Why not a good character? Like Zack. Me? Gungaga. Who, who's also here, maybe. It's unclear. I think he's alive, personally. All my friends tell me I'm wrong, but it's hard to argue with a guy saying outright, Wow, I got all of them. Was what I wrote before I got confirmed in the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania that Zack indeed is alive. The translation basically says that this new scene depicts Zack as well and good. But how are there two buster swords? How can this be? If the answer is alternate universes or time traveling shenanigans, I'm out. Zack actually being alive in the Seven universe kind of messes up a lot of character moments considering he's kind of the core of everyone's crises. Cloud, Tifa, and Aerith all have stuff with him. If he's alive, what is Tifa hiding? from Cloud. I am simultaneously excited and in a blazing inferno of why. 
As long as it's not that, I'm totally okay with Square Enix going ahead and doing whatever the heck they want. In fact, I welcome them rebooting Final Fantasy VII into a whole new franchise and doing a whole bunch of new things with it, as long as it's not compilation, please. But I think the execution of the whispers, the over-the-top final battle, and the overusage of Sephiroth are taking the wrong lessons from the original game. Y'all know that scene I went into way too much detail about earlier with the Midgar Zolem? If they decide to go with that, how will it have any effect knowing that Cloud is doing quadruple backflips and has enough strength to literally slice boulders in half? Cloud isn't supposed to be that powerful this early in the story, especially considering the events of Crisis Core and the fact that he dies in one hit. I personally feel like they pulled up the equivalent of the Matrix Path of Neo. The ending to that game has the witch house he's coming out and saying, hey, this movie doesn't have an actual final boss, but here's one just for you. But I think they could have achieved the desired narrative effect of things changing without all of the flashiness, flips, and glam. Am I excited for the future? Absolutely. Am I worried? Even more so. I just hope they don't lean into the over-the-topness that was a main issue I had with Advent Children. As long as people aren't literally tossing Cloud higher and higher into the air to punch Punch Meteor back into space, I will be okay. Now, I realize I just laid out some pretty heavy criticism, but Final Fantasy VII Remake is a lot more than its last couple of hours. In fact, if there's one thing I think this game does well, it's the small details, and why not just gush about it? Let's gush. I think it's clear as day that the developers of Remake are total fanboys of the original. You didn't have to remake the stupid machine gun in Walmart. You really didn't have to, but you did. That little detail alone shows how sketchy Walmart was, and it's great here. Walmart in general was nearly perfectly done, minus Leslie. But you know what makes up for that? Twerking Cloud! <laughs> Truly, there's nothing more Final Fantasy VII than the absurd minigames and stuff they make Cloud do in that game. That boy can snowboard, perform CPR, not get railed by 20 dudes at the same time, and now he's throwing it down before getting in drag. Loved it. That love extended to the soundtrack. I haven't gone into it yet, but holy crap, the soundtrack. Every Final Fantasy VII fan would be used to let the battles begin playing every few seconds, but Remake instead gives every zone its own dynamic soundtrack using a piece from the original. Who knew that underneath the rotting pizza would sound fantastic as a battle theme? And it helps that even the standard boss and battle themes appear like a million times throughout the soundtrack as a motif. I'm used to AAA games having the soundtrack be way more muted or orchestral in a generic sense, but the remake original soundtrack combines elements of different genres to create something that is totally listenable on its own. The only weak song in the entire soundtrack to me was, unfortunately, probably the one I heard the most, the Wall Market theme. They should have just kept using oppressed people, it's correct from a narrative, motif, and song title perspective. The replacement song just kind of feels generic and almost out of place with the rest of the score. However, props to Square Enix for acknowledging their roots and putting Uematsu into the game before he gives you the normal Final Fantasy theme. That's a nice touch. If you were to add up all of my nitpicks outside of the ending and whispers, they're really pretty minuscule. I was sad we didn't get to ride the pinball machine into the avalanche headquarters. I didn't like not being able to spam normal potions outside of battle, considering I do that in every game. I had a bunch of technical issues, including multiple hangups and soft locks, but most of that stuff can be patched out. It's certainly held together way better than 15, but some of the graphical pop-in can be distracting. I'm sure it'll be fine on the PC. But you know what outweighs that? The emotional impact of certain scenes. When Cloud is dismissed from Avalanche and the rest of them celebrate their first victory together with a cheers. The camera angle there. Cloud learning what a high five is over the course of 20 hours. The fact that they kept the stupid try button push mini game in. The build up for the Airbuster as a boss fight, making Shinra seem like an actual threat when that entire reactor was like four minutes in the original game. Also the music in that fight. Holy God. Rendering the Hell House at all, let alone making it one of the best boss fights in the game. If this game was just boss fights and cutscenes, I'd be down. That's the best stuff. All of those small details add up to let you pass on certain things. Like, wow, everyone is so gorgeous that I'm okay with all of the backgrounds looking like low quality JPEGs. Wow, look at all these individual bullets coming out of Barrett's gun arm, but what is wrong with your face? I think a lot of these technical issues will be worked out when the eventual PC or PlayStation 5 version of this comes out, so I'll have 
have that to look forward to in the future. When Final Fantasy VII Remake was a year out, I wasn't that excited for it. Like I always say, VII has fallen directly in the middle of my Final Fantasy tier list. That's still really good, by the way. But Remake did something I didn't think it could do. It made me like Final Fantasy VII more, and that's all I could really ask for. It's like we're the Materia vendor, and we finally got our hands on the sauce. The sauce! But most importantly, Remake has done something that I thought wasn't possible in the modern era. It's brought Final Fantasy to the forefront of the gaming industry once again. It's the cutting edge of what's possible on the console and PC, and it's something that will be remembered for years to come. Calling it now, sequel, Final Fantasy VII Reunion. See you in three years. Also, one more thing. Apparently, this little punk ass from Final Fantasy X2 named Shinra may or may not be the guy that started Shinra Corp, meaning that Final Fantasy VII and X take place in the same world. If true, that's wild. Who would have thought Machina was actually bad for the planet? <laughs> Which, in retrospect, makes Waka somewhat of the greatest prophet of his time. Boom! <laughs> like happy festival fireworks, yeah? So yeah, uh, this is where we're going to be ending the video. I realize this is pretty different from what I normally do. I uh, was thinking about making this two videos, or originally I was just going to make it like well, like one 20 minute review, but I was like, I couldn't stop writing, my fingers couldn't stop going, and I'm like, you know what? It's time to try something different. I've been doing this for seven years, and sometimes how I feel changes. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments, because I would love to hear any feedback you have to do with this, and I would also love to talk about every Persona game chronologically? Hello? But before we go, I gotta say, I'm looking to settle a debate with my friends Colin, Super Eye Patch, Wolf, and Wooly Versus. We talked about Final Fantasy VII for like two hours at MAGFest. Call me! Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Brandon Howe, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Cliff Pro, Donald Dowdy, David Molnar, Eli Shane Stoffenecker, I Me, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jordan McCaffrey, Josh Garbage Lord, Kieran Arter, Legend Gary, Nitron, Plasma Phoenix, and Vlad Lust. Thank you all very much for your support. Hey, let me know what you think about this in the comments. Do it. All pressure, peer pressure on the video. Do it. Let me know. Because I would love to make more long form video essay kind of stuff. And also some of the stuff that I always do. I like to have fun here. I'm in a new place now. The set's going to be changing. I know the audio was kind of weird, but I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting. Sorry for the delay on this one. And I'll catch you guys next time.